Yeah. And I think it's good to have that pursuit. If I could just go shoot everything I wanted to shoot, I would, again, get bored with what I'm doing. So it's good to have those goals as very rare photos. Um, an example of one I have is lightning over a lion's head. I mean, how often does that happen? I think it's happened twice, maybe three times since I've lived here, like eight years. So, you know, there's things like that that are quite rare. And when you get them, you like, yes, I got it. And you tick it off your back of list. Yeah. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode. Tonight we are recording in the evening, yes. We are speaking to a guest who is in the landscape photography space. So for those of you that own a camera, you have probably tried very hard as your novice little photography skill set on to take some landscape photos and sometimes you think it's good. Then for the people who really like Cape Town, like me, I'm sure you've been following our guest Kyle on Instagram for a few years. So I took the initiative to reach out to Kyle and he was kind enough to just respond with so much kindness and enthusiasm to chat to us today. So we're speaking to Kyle Gage. I hope I pronounced that correctly, but uh, Kyle, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. I get tired of sitting at home and not talking to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Here, here. Maybe to uh, kick us off, can you give us a background of um, just how you got into the landscape photography space, what happened before and where you are now? Sure. Well, I, I don't think there are any landscape photographers that actually, I suppose, study to do landscape photography. I suppose there may be a very small <laughs> percentage that do. Um, it's not one of those photography genres that you that you decide to do from from leaving high school and that's what you pursue. Um, generally, most landscape photographers that I've encountered have always come from a different part of life and have moved on from a different career and found a love for, for nature and photography and combined them and have managed to make a living. Mm. Um, so that's kind of my story. I mean, I <clears throat> was working at UCT in the Department of Surgery. Um, I have a PhD there. And I was doing research for several years. And then a friend of mine invited me to go take photos with him in Cape Town. And my passion and my love for photography grew from there. And sure. eventually that career was coming to an end. And there was this new opportunity for me um, to pursue what I love doing. And that's what I get the privilege to do now. Um, <clears throat> go out into nature and wow. take photos. I mean, that's my office. What That's a amazing. beautiful office. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so um, I've got a question and I, I've got a bunch that, that are, that, that are burning, but I'll start with maybe a few um, <laughs> um, more casual ones. I think one of the things that I find interesting, and it's something that I think I'm seeing m um, more and more is people who sort of start off in one field and then, eventually land up in a different field or, or in, in a different specialization or typically just somewhere they didn't expect if you were to sort of ask them when they were first sort of beginning their, their um, tertiary education. So can you tell us a little bit about like some in the, in the early stages when you first started doing photography and you maybe were taking your first few pictures or, you know, you got your first camera or whatever it, it might be, like what were the things that actually sort of like spoke to you that made you think that maybe this is something that you want to you know take seriously or take forward or like you know turn into into something sure i mean that's a, there's a lot of stuff in there uh, <laughs> <laughs> um i i'm a firm believer of you know there's a different stage in life for different things it's just because you studied mm -hmm. one thing doesn't need 
you need to be locked into that for the rest of your lives. And definitely you're seeing more and more of it now where people are doing something yeah. for a few years and then changing to something else. And and I think in today's day and age, it's a lot easier to do that. It's a lot easier for me as an individual to reach an audience and clients per se. Whereas before I couldn't do that. I didn't have that access to to directly to my clientele. Um, and mm -hmm. the same thing with, with my wife. I mean, she studied genetics and now she's an author and she writes books and she self-publishes and and she makes money because she can reach her demographic directly. So I, I, mm -hmm. I think that's it's kind of two parts. I think without having the social media side and you know being able to grow your mailing list and reach people directly, I don't think I would be doing what I am doing today just because it, mm -hmm. it wouldn't be possible to survive and, and make a living. Um, when I first mm -hmm. started taking photos and that, I definitely didn't think I would be doing it as a career one day. That wasn't even in my mind. Um, mm -hmm. And just as I started doing it and growing and grew a passion for it, I was selling prints. People were buying things and they were saying, well, don't you want to teach me how to do this? So then I was doing private tuitions with them. And then that grew into doing workshops, which grew into doing tours. And then eventually at that point, I was like, well, I'm making an income. I can pay my bills. So let's take the plunge and, and do it. So it, it just grew piecemeal, mm -hmm. I think, um, to that point. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. It's always, uh, we hear from quite a few people who, who step from a, you know, like a side hustle into a full-time gig. It's, it seems to be a very organic way of um, how, how it unfolds when you start to do it. I did want to ask, um, you, you said, you know, you went to go shoot some photos in Cape Town with a friend and that's kind of how you fell in love with landscape photography. Did you at, at that point when you started doing photography explore other styles? And then did that help you solidify which one you chose to, so to say, specialize in or focus on? That's, that's a very good question, actually. Because <clears throat> I actually get asked it quite often. I get asked to do weddings yeah. and do family sure. shoots and that <laughs> and um, for mm. me I have I have no passion for shooting people and I think I discovered that pretty <laughs> early on um, <laughs> so my friend who got I me involved anyone either. <laughs> in photography I hate uh, people too <laughs> on a side note it's so it's so funny when I'm sitting at a coffee shop and you'll be talking about going to the Kruger or shooting wildlife and you'll be like oh, I shot that rhino and you, you know, just think like, what, is, what are other people <laughs> hearing when, when you're talking, if they don't know you're talking about photography. Mm -hmm. So uh, sometimes yeah. it escapes you a little bit and you're like, yeah, I was shooting this guy and you know, who's listening to you? But anyway, <laughs> uh, a bit, yeah. bit distracted. So actually the, so the first Sorry. time I went and, and shot with him, so my friend's a wedding photographer. So he only shoots people. Mm. He loves shooting people. That's his passion. And he wanted to scout out the super dodgy location uh, near Kailicha, this abandoned water park. Yeah. Um, and mm. I just moved to Cape Town. So I was like, sure, let's go. I didn't know what was dodgy or not dodgy yeah. back in the day. <laughs> um, so we arrive there. We drive past like these dodgy cars, like drug deals going down in the parking lots. And I'm like, okay, this mm. is cool. And then we get out and then we go in these like vagrants that just made fires and these abandoned buildings that we were like exploring and taking photos of. Um, yeah, so it was, it, was, it was actually quite exciting, which is, is what I enjoyed. Mm. And there was like that element of, you don't know what you're gonna see around the next corner, which is I think still a mm -hmm. large part of what I enjoy about the photography that I do. You know, you never know what conditions you're gonna get and you pursuing, you know, that amazing sunset you know with that composition you wanted and you don't get it most of the time so a, a large part of what i enjoy is that that pursuit of trying to get an image that you've maybe um, envisioned or have thought about and now you're actually trying to go and get it whereas i think if i was just taking pictures of like stock or food photography where there was a large control element in it i would probably yeah. get mm -hmm. quite bored so i quite like that discovering and that mm. you never know what you're going to get side of the photography i think that drives me that's such an interesting way of thinking about it i've never actually put it in that perspective because like you say when you're doing food photography or portraits of people your environment is a lot more under your control 
than it would be if you, you know, shooting landscape. That's so fascinating. You mentioned, um, you know, you have the, a vision of a photo or a shot in your mind and then you kind of go out and you chase the shot, so to say. Uh, can you share us with us, what is that process? Is that is that something or a process you often follow? Do you always have a vision or an image in mind of the the picture that you're trying to capture? And does it always end up that way? Or yeah, it's a, that's a yes and no question because hmm. you know a lot of guys will say, "Oh, you're really lucky to go out and get that photo or go get those conditions that you had." and a large part of the luck that I have involves planning. I, I, I do a lot of planning before I go out, but it's it's kind of spontaneous planning, if that makes sense. So mm. I know there's certain conditions I'm looking for in the weather, for example, to get like the low fog coming in in Cape Town. I know the spots that when it comes in from certain directions, those are the spots I want to go to to shoot. So I know exactly where I want to go. I know what conditions I'm looking for. <laughs> Yeah, it has mm. to, and then otherwise, and and then you go, and then you're probably going to get it maybe three out of ten times that you go. So there's seven times you're going that no one knows about because you didn't get any shots. Um, That's a and then time. when you get there, you got to adapt and you got to move and 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 to the weather conditions. But there is a, a large degree of planning and preparation that goes into it um, to put yourself in the right position for the potential of something happening. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's very cool. And th there's something that I almost want to pull out of what you said and have us explore a little bit, because the one thing that I find interesting about um, landscape photography is how you actually apply creativity in some sense, because, you know, as you sort of said with the other types of photography, you, your, <clears throat> your, your means of expressing creativity is almost the aspect that you have control over and that's usually like you know the posture of the model or if it's like a, a setup that you're doing um you might in it's in the actual um, composition of your of, of of that sort of setup but when it comes to landscape photography <laughs> there's <laughs> a lot less that's in your control so can you maybe t talk to us a little bit about how how you how you think about the role of creativity in that process because you did mention that a lot of it is planned so like, how do you, how do you think about that? Yeah. So <clears throat> I just want to come back to something first, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I believe for photography, you need to be passionate about the photography that you pursue. So like I said, I know many food photographers, wedding photographers, portrait photographers that are super passionate about what they do because, you know, mm -hmm. that's, that's their area of photography that they love. And that's why I find going across genres that you're not passionate about is quite difficult. So if I was to do weddings, I don't think I would do the bride mm. justice because I'm not passionate. I'm not feeding off of that person's energy. Um, and then mm -hmm. I would myself get bored doing it in time because it's, it's not my passion for photography. And, and I find mm -hmm. that you, you sometimes get photographers that try and do everything like, like jack of all trades and you often see mm -hmm. them burning out in a few years time because you know they're not doing what they're passionate about yes they they're doing more to earn more money and and I, and I definitely see that side but because it's such a a creative you know art form you got to have that passion mm -hmm. for what you're doing and i think that then feeds into a lot of the work that you put out you know my old job i used to struggle to get up at 8 30 p.m to go be at work at nine um, mm. Now I get mm. up at 2 a.m. and climb a mountain and I have no problem doing that. So, <laughs> you know, you, to me, that really defines if you're passionate about something. If you, if you wow. can get out of bed and you enjoy doing it, then, then you must yeah. be doing something, something right. Yeah. I it forgot what the question was. <laughs> so, no worries. So I was asking about like the application of creativity in landscape photography. Um, because oh, yes. I, I, um, I was... Go ahead. So, so there is a large part that, that I do that is controlled. Like when I shoot my astrophotography, you know, I can plan exactly which way the Milky Way is going to move and what my composition is going to look like. So, you know, 
there's a large part of that is planned. I don't really have to think about it when I get there and I've set up and I've found my composition. Um, similar with seascapes, you know, I can plan my long exposures and know how the water's going to move. I can plan that with my leading lines and things like that. So there, there's a large part that once you know the techniques and the skill set, you can adapt it pretty easily to any situation. Um, but then it mm. comes into those instances where you get surprised by something like a magical sunset that you you kind of was hoping was going to happen, but you hadn't, you know, you don't know and you don't count on it until it happens. And then you have to, mm. you have a very short window to <clears throat> capture the content. Um, so there's a lot of pressure to actually in like a short 15, 20 minute window to make the most mm. out of something that might not happen again mm -hmm. for six months, a year, you might not be around. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's some shots that I've been trying to get that I've still been waiting three, four years for, and I've got them in the back of my mind. And when the conditions Jeez, line up, wow. I, I wait and, and I see if they'll, they'll work. And, <clears throat> and I'm not telling you what they are because it's secret, because I want to get the photo first. <laughs> 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 but there, I was about to ask you. <laughs> but there are, there are certain things. And I think it's good to have the pursuit. If I could just go shoot everything I mm -hmm. wanted to shoot, I would, again, get bored with what I'm doing. So it's good to have mm -hmm. those goals as very rare photos. Um, an example of one I have is lightning over lion's head. I mean, how often does that happen? I think it's happened... Yeah. twice yeah. maybe three times since i've lived here like eight years wow so you know there's things wow. like that that are quite rare and when you get them sure. you like yes i got it and you mm -hmm. take it off your bucket list yeah it does That's sound amazing. to me like you quite an adrenaline junkie and i <laughs> and i didn't quite uh, <laughs> pick this up when i looked looked at your photography or your instagram and when we first met but you know it seems like the the aspect or um, part of uncertainty that that plays a role in your day-to-day -day job mm. and like how you said you fell in love when you guys drove into a very unsafe area and you didn't know what was going to happen next. <laughs> you don't tell my wife this, mm. I'm not going to watch. <laughs> so, my, my wife has one rule and that's I'm not allowed to go alone. That's the only, <laughs> the only rule I have to abide Good. by. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, you know, there's something special about being out on the mountain at, you know, sunrise, just sitting there, mm -hmm. you know, peaceful. I think it's very soothing for the soul. And I've thought about mm -hmm. this a lot. And I, I personally would not do that. I would not hike. I, I never hiked before. Um, I hike for the photography. I don't, I'm not a hiker. Sure. I only climb to mm -hmm. that height because I want to get that photo from that vantage point. And I think photography mm -hmm. has forced me quite a lot to to do those those type of adventurous things um, in pursuit of mm -hmm. you know new content and and new photos. Um, but I do enjoy it when I get up there and I've made it up and you're sitting there on top of the world. It's it's something quite special, which is difficult to portray in the photo. Yeah, is that that one photo? Um, I think was it the Dragonsburg? I'm trying to go look on your feed if it was a Jorgensburg photo or maybe it was just Table Mountain from the back with a lot of fog. No, it was a Jorgensburg photo. Yes, yeah. So you hiked up Jorgensburg, I'm assuming. Um, I've done Jorgensburg a lot. I don't think I have any fog ones at Jorgensburg though, but I do do, I try and do the Berg once a year, but my portfolio is still growing on that. Um, nice. But I definitely have mm -hmm. quite a few fog ones up around Table Mountain, um, this whole area, um, Simon's Town side, uh, Camp Space side. Yeah, speaking about the, I just wanted to mention one story uh, about the adrenaline junk. So, mm -hmm. sure, two years ago now, I, I had a fall and I, I imploded the side of my face and actually have four plates and a, a mesh under my eye um, installed. Whoa. Um, and we were hiking with a, a group of friends um, and uh, a mountain guide um, just outside of Cape Town to a waterfall. And it was quite wet and it had been raining and we were hiking. And I didn't fall off like a cliff or anything hectic like that. I literally slipped off of a large rock as I was stepping up on it. Yeah. And I came down on my face and there was a nice little rock the size yes. of a fist that hit me on my cheek here. And it basically oh. shattered all the bones in my face 
And luckily oh, it crazy. pinched off the yes. nerve, so I had no pain. Everything just went numb. And I had to still hike three Ks <laughs> out, <coughs> out. So we hiked out and then uh, I was like, no, I'm fine. I'll just sleep it off. And then my friend's like, no, I think we should just go to the hospital and just get an x-ray because you hit your head. I'm like, okay, well, that makes sense. So we went, had an x-ray taken. They're like, cool, you staying in here tonight. Tomorrow you're going in for surgery and we're going to put four plates in your face and a mesh on wow. your eye. Yo. And so I'm that like, is crazy. I'm like saying to the doctor, I'm like, look, look next week I'm hiking in the Drakensberg. It's all booked. I've got people <laughs> coming, you know, like, can I do this? And he's like, well, you don't hike with your face. So I was like, okay, cool. And then a week later I was in the Berg hiking and it was, it was great. Wise words from a good doctor. Yeah. You don't hike with yeah. Your face. So, but it has <laughs> taught me to be a bit more cautious and to double check my footing. I will say that. Yeah. Sure. Fair enough. Fair enough. I, I have to say, one thing that's really surprised me is I hadn't previously considered the fact that landscape photography is such, generally, it's such a long-term profession. Just the time scale of everything is seems to sort of just expand. It um, seems to sort of just expand. Because, you know, you, 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 you were mentioning about, like, you know, how much beforehand you have to plan and the fact that you have to wait for all of these naturally occurring cycles. But then, I mean, even if you sort of compare a, you know, let's say a, even a wedding photographer to a landscape photographer, essentially their window to capture a specific moment in some sense is a few seconds, if, if it's sort of like a natural occurrence. But then there's more events that happen that they have the opportunity to capture. But then on the other hand, like landscape photography is you've maybe got a number of minutes to capture a thing, <laughs> but then if you don't get it, you have to wait, you know, however, however long it, it may be, which I think is something that's pretty interesting. Um, and something that I, I think I've found is it's almost like healthy for your like creative side to sort of do things that you don't finish off in, you know, a day or an hour or or something like that. Those sort of like long projects that you can kind of like work on for a little bit and then do something else and then work on for a, l a little bit of a while. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. I do, I do have a follow-up question, but um, I just wanted to, to sort of make a comment on that. Yeah, it's, there's definitely a large part of, a foresight that has to go into it. Um, for example, if I want to go shoot a new region I've never been to, um, for example, I want to go shoot the south of Namibia. I've never been there. There's only mm -hmm. so much you can do by looking at what other people have done and speaking to people who've been there before. But at some point, you have to go on a recce trip, which is what we call them, where we will go out mm -hmm. and travel there for a week, five days, you know, go camping. I'll go with some friends and we'll basically do a recce trip and scout out the places we want to go and shoot and, and shoot them if it's possible. But it's mainly to know where to go that when the good weather happens, you know exactly where to sure. go. Because mm -hmm. the worst thing is to get to a spot and the sky is amazing, it's on fire or whatever weather is happening, is a big storm cell on the horizon and you haven't planned your compositions, you don't know where to shoot, you end up just shooting and you mm. come away with nothing usable. It's, it's, it's terrible, it's, it's the worst thing. So yeah, you definitely have to go then and do the recce missions and then you learn the weather patterns for the different areas. Um, for example, now Cape Town's great for photography. We're going into our wet season, so we're gonna be shooting waterfalls now. So you need to know where you're gonna go shoot the mm. waterfalls, where the waterfalls are. You know, the better at sunrise, sunset, you only get access, you have to apply for permits. There's a couple of places I go to, it's quite hard to get permits. Mm -hmm. So I have to apply a month in advance and hope the date I picked is just after rain. So it's, you know, yeah. there's all those things. And if it's not, yeah. well, then you got to wait till the next time. And, <clears throat> you know, it might get snow, it's snow in Cape Town mm -hmm. on the mountains, very spontaneous, but you need to kind of know which regions to go to, you know, go to Montrachel, mm -hmm. do I go to Yonkers Hook, where do I go and shoot the snow? Um, and then the Overberg, you know, the canola field. So you learn the seasons for your region and your area and, and where to go and you slowly build mm -hmm. a collection of, of places to go to. Um, 
And that's why you'll find some landscape photographers are very secretive or, or guarded with their locations because they don't want other people to go mm -hmm. and, and shoot those spots that they've done a lot of work for and, and research to identify and find. And I, I fully understand mm -hmm. that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Also, it's to protect that some some areas you know you go to are maybe um, quite sensitive environmentally, like in the Cedarburg. You don't want a hundred other people going there all the time and maybe disturbing or, or damaging the area. So it's 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 quite tough um, from a landscape photography side. You know exactly how much information do you put out when you you you, mm. you put out pictures, and there is that kind of I think responsibility to make sure also that you are going to places that maybe aren't illegal, you haven't hopped over onto some private farmer's land um, because you don't want mm -hmm. other people to go to those places as well and try and do the same things that you're trying to do. So I think there's also an ethical responsibility as a landscape yeah. photographer yeah. in what you put out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that is Sorry. very interesting. And I, I don't know, I guess I, I wouldn't have thought about it from that perspective. Um, because I guess yeah, you do sort of influence the people, and especially when you're in in a in a in a visual sort of um, discipline or skill set. Um, as soon as anybody sort of discovers something like either new or or remarkable, people are going to do what they can to to sort of replicate that. Um, so in the in the early part of our, our chat, you had talked a little bit about the fact that you you first started by taking photos, and then some people started asking you um to to kind of like show them or train them or tutor them or whatever it might be, and it eventually sort of became like workshops and tours. So can you maybe tell us a little bit about what what that's like? So let's say I'm I'm a um as aspiring or budding landscape photographer and i've sort of maybe come across your website and i'm interested in in, in kind of getting involved can you maybe give us like a, a brief overview of like what what they might expect um yeah. and maybe a few things that they might learn so i just want to make one point before i go into that it's, it's quite funny mm -hmm. because from my previous job i used to have masters and phd students under me and i used to enjoy that one-on-one -on -one practical teaching and, and and mentoring of my students. And I found mm -hmm. I've been able to bring that across into my new job, um, wow. doing landscape photography, um, which is what I enjoyed mm. in my old job. So, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of skills I think that carry across from different walks of life that you can bring into things. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> yeah, so workshops we do, I work with another photographer named John Kerrin and we work under the umbrella of Venture KJ, Venture with Kyle and John. And we run basically workshops across Southern Africa. Um, most of them are in South Africa. And then we do, um, once a year we do a Namibia trip, a big Namibia tour where we go and, and shoot all the wow. iconic places in Namibia. Um, so most of our trips, we stay in one location. We generally book out a private farm, um, such as the Cedarburg. We do Clarence. Um, we do um, Arniston, which is a seascapes um, location. Um, and we do locations all across Southern Africa, depending on different genres. So we will mm -hmm. design our workshops around a genre, such as astrophotography, long exposures, seascapes. So if that's something that you're interested mm -hmm. in learning and a skill set you want to develop, then that's the workshop you'll book on. Um, we generally mm -hmm. limit them to between six and eight people on a workshop. So that's one to four people, which is a very nice sure. number yeah. for the, the client mm -hmm. to learn yeah. from. And then there's a large social aspect that we have in our workshop. So we'll have a big house. We'll all eat together. We'll do workshops together in the, in the house. We'll do presentations and edit photos together. Mm -hmm. And it's great because everyone has something in common. They all love photography. So you get all these people from different walks of life coming and then chatting about their trips and photography and what cameras they use and stuff. So it's, it's very social. Mm -hmm. It's very engaging. And then we direct basically John and I look at because each person's difference so each person will be at a different skill level and they'll have mm -hmm. different things they want to take away from the workshop they'll want to learn different things 
And my, the worst mm. for me is just standing people in a row and saying, okay, point your camera this way, turn your settings <laughs> to this, okay, take a photo. That I'll die if I do that. So we try and really tailor it to each person. So throughout the trip, we mm. learn what you like, what what you want to achieve from the trip, and then we will take you to a location and sh and help you to achieve that skill set or get that shot that you want to get. So. Um, from the client point of view, I think they get a lot out of it. Um, the, our catering is amazing. Mm. Some people just come for the food, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but because of that, we get about, I was going to say 70%, but I've just redone the numbers for the last year. And I think we're on about an 80% rebook rate. So people that have come on a workshop yeah. will yeah. generally book another one later in the year or next year. So it's for us, it means we're doing something right and we're heading in the right direction. And That's amazing. Yeah, it's growing from strength to strength. Um, yeah, the, the trick now is to keep sure. finding new locations for guys to come and, and explore with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so amazing. Um, and I think that that's such a nice uh, package that you offer because a lot of people offer workshops and stuff, but it is either it can be a large group or it's just photography in isolation. But I think because it's combined, like you say, you know, there's good catering. It's over a few days as opposed to just a single day. It gives you you the time to get to know the person a bit more, that person as well, to also get a little bit more comfortable with themselves in the setting. Because it can be quite uh, scary and intimidating trying to walk away with good shots, you know, to also get your money's worth, so to say. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's almost like a little vacation. Um, so to say, or at least from my perspective, and maybe for the people <laughs> listening, I'm just hinting out there, you know, Father's Day is on the way, hint, hint, <laughs> if you, <laughs> if you want to get your, your father a really good present and maybe tag along because it seems to be very much worth it, especially for the food. <laughs> yeah, the, the workshops, mm. it's, it's so difficult to sell that side of a workshop because it's easy to put up the photos and say, oh, look at these amazing photos you can get when you go to the location. And, yeah. and generally, yeah. that's what people will book on. They're like, oh, I want to go shoot the Milky Way in the Cedarburg. Um, so we'll get guys flying. A lot of guys mm. from Joburg come down because they don't have clear skies up there. They'll come down and, and do, do workshops with us. And what I think people are mostly amazed by is, is the, you know, the social side, you know, the interpersonal side, the learning make they basically make new photography friends and they keep in touch afterwards and it's so mm -hmm. difficult to mm -hmm. sell that in marketing on a brochure where it doesn't look cheesy you know you make a video you're like hi i'm your friend you know so it's <laughs> it's it's really difficult for us to 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 sell that side of the workshop but it is a large mm -hmm. part of why people rebook sure mm -hmm. yeah that's amazing but obviously, you know, word of mouth is a, is a big marketing tool and it's obviously working as well, very in, in a good way for you. Alfie and I were speaking a little bit beforehand. Um, and actually, the first time we spoke to you, Carl, you know, I think you also made the joke about um, why did you pick landscape photography? Because it's, it's not the most uh, lucrative uh, form of photography if you had to pick a type of and um, we were like pondering why that is. And obviously we have our own ideas. Of maybe it's because we live in such a vain society and we all consume people. And But <laughs> I would actually like to hear your insight because you, you, in this space, you have a lot more context than us. Why do you think landscape photography isn't as appreciated or isn't as valued uh, as other forms of photography in today's age? I mean, I, I don't think it's that it's not appreciated. I just think the mm -hmm. the market pool is much smaller. You know, the, the number of people that are maybe want to go and shoot landscapes is maybe much smaller than people with families that want to do family shoots. You know, a lot of people want to do, mm -hmm. there's a much bigger market um, in, in different areas, you know, a guy yeah. doing opening a restaurant needs to hire a photographer to take pictures of his food. A guy who's mm. trying to sell products online needs to hire a product photographer to take nice products because that sells his, his product. So 
there, there's there's more of an industry, I think, in in other areas. Whereas in the landscape photography, it's generally more seen as a hobby. So people are doing it mm. just as a hobby on the side. Okay. So either they don't have the the capital to spend on on that hobby is a, is a large part, or they are, you know, traveling overseas because maybe that's more their their passion to go do photography, landscape photography in a different area because they've explored the local area. Um, <clears throat> so I just think that the target pool is is much smaller, and yeah. it just means then you have to either hustle more, um, diversify your, your revenue streams, make sure you are targeting all the areas. And I suppose it's the same with any small entrepreneur, you know, you've, you've left your, your nine to five to work 24 seven, you've got to be doing your own marketing, you've got to be doing your own admin, <laughs> accounting, all your own stuff, you know, so the more you hustle, I suppose, the, the better, the more people you can reach and, and the better that you're your engagement, um, but it's also, you have to build up. It's a very small community. A lot of it spreads by word of mouth. So I do a lot of talks at the ca local camera clubs and then those people will come on a workshop or they'll tell their friends to come on a workshop. And, you know, once you get known in the community, then it's the word of mouth does spread. So yeah. you definitely, it's, it's, it is quite a, I wouldn't say closed, community but everyone sort of knows everyone so you, you have to you can't just like run in and say come on a workshop with me you've got to slowly build mm -hmm. up okay. to that point the trust yeah <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah um and so, so speaking on the community because uh, at least commenting on the design community in some sense um which is i guess my, myself and stephanie's playground um it's maybe i think Firstly, I'd assume that there are probably more communities than landscape photographers specifically. And I'd say they're probably reasonably easy to sort of find. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you know, for a person who maybe does do landscape photography as a hobby or might be interested in, in sort of entering that space? Like, how does, how does one get into this community or maybe get started in the space of landscape photography? What are a few tips and tricks that you might recommend? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. Um, a lot of, not a lot, but we often see, especially with uh, ladies that want to get into landscape photography, they are afraid to go out and shoot on their own. Understandably, if you're mm -hmm. out at sunset, at the beach, on the mountain with expensive camera gear, mm -hmm. you know, they feel quite vulnerable. And they'll book to come on a workshop because, you know, there's safety and they know that you've planned to go to areas that are, are relatively safe or on a private farm. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I think for some of them, they, they'll book to come on the workshop because they are afraid to go and shoot on their own or because they don't have the community to go and, and shoot with. Um, so mm -hmm. the camera clubs are, are a great space for that. Um, so mm -hmm. a lot of the towns, I think nearly every little town always has a little camera club everywhere. However, camera clubs, which I probably shouldn't say because I speak at all of them, are are very, not niche, but very old school clubs. You know, they you enter your mm -hmm. competitions and they have things called salons where you get judged on your photos. And I think today, and I, okay. you know, someone doesn't necessarily want to have to go through all yeah. of that. They just want to go out with a group. Yeah. And, and take photos. Um, mm -hmm. So until they make other photography friends and then build up a little community and then there'll be groups that do photo walks and things like that, it's quite difficult for someone to get into the community. And I think social media helps a lot because you'll follow people that take photos that you like and hopefully eventually in time you'll maybe chat to them or engage with them. And most of the guys are quite friendly and they'll chat back and eventually you'll pick up someone that, that you enjoy and they'll hopefully go and, and shoot with you. Um, <clears throat> so because of that as well, I run a Facebook group called South African Landscapes. Um, it's not a very big group. Mm -hmm. I think about 1,200 people in the group from across Southern Africa. Um, wow. And once, it was difficult with COVID, but we try and do like once a quarter a, a meetup where everyone who wants to come mm -hmm. can come and we'll go do a sunrise shoot or a sunset shoot at Bloberg, I'll pick a location depending what it, whatever is interesting. 
And do we generally get about 10 to 20 people that will come out that are on the group that, you know, you've never met before that, that want to come out and take photos. So I definitely think there is the community is there and the people are there. It's just trying to mm-hmm. connect with them. And, you know, it's, it's difficult for people feeling like they don't want to invade your space or, and, and there are times where I do want to go shoot, you know, on my own to get certain photos on my own. So it's, it's 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 a line that you got to kind of walk to to mm-hmm. you know I got to give I want to give back to the community I want I want these people to come and and take landscape photos because the more people that are doing it the, you know the bigger the the community grows and and you know the more potential work I can have so it's it's a mm-hmm. it's a it's a balance I suppose yeah. to try and get that yeah um and and I think that. It's interesting because, like, one of the things that, that, that I think is maybe a little bit difficult with something like, like photography, I'd say maybe versus versus design or maybe versus, like, other tech-related um, sort of communities is, in some sense, it, it's kind of like having to, to, to join like a, a, a art class or a drawing class or something like that. If you're starting from a place where you're not, maybe not that good or you're maybe just learning, like you almost need to, if you, let's say, go on a a, um, a thing with, with, with a number of other people, you, you need to show your work. In, in some sense, you need to show, you don't have to show your work, but there's like a aspect of sharing. Um, and I guess I, I always... I at least would think that there's there'd be at least a, a, a hesitance to sort of put yourself out there because in some sense it also means putting your work out there. I don't know if that's something that you either experienced or found with some of this, your students and people that you, you, you sort of work with. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> I've actually never thought about it like that. Um, but that now that you say it, I mean, it makes it obviously makes sense that people need to put their work out there. Uh, it's difficult. I, I mean, I'll get clients that have been shooting for like forty years that will come and they've got all the latest camera gear and they've been wow. shooting. And I ask them, you know, what what do you do with your photos? And they like, I, I just keep them and I, I enjoy shooting. So for them, the I suppose the sharing or the editing aspect is is not what they enjoy about photography. It's more the pursuit of being able to capture that that photo. So I suppose everyone's got a, a slightly different area of the photography that they maybe um, enjoy and love. Um, but on that on that mm. note, you know, <clears throat> I work a lot with a, a brand called Nikon Nikon cameras. I work a lot with mm-hmm. them, but I'm sure most of the, all the other brands do do the same thing, and they do a lot of uh, free talks where they give back to the community, where guys can come to a talk um, at Nikon House in Joburg. They arrange at Orms in Cape Town. Um, and I speak at, at some of these talks. We do workshops. We've got some exciting workshops coming up um, with them the, the rest of this year. And generally, those are either free or are like 100 bucks or 200 bucks just to, to confirm your seat. And, <clears throat> you know, we, we get maybe, I'd say, about 20 to 30 people um, coming to those, mm. and and I think that's a great way for guys to maybe learn something yeah. or, or engage with photographers mm. without maybe necessarily having to show their work or put their work out there um, until mm-hmm. the point where they maybe feel comfortable to do so. Yeah, yeah, I do, that's Alfie. I do point. agree, kind of, with what you're saying, or at least uh, what um, my perceived perception or experience of it would be is um, firstly, Kyle, like you mentioned, you know, the the community isn't that big. So there's the sense that you are stepping into a community of everyone else knowing each other, but also everyone, Mm -hmm. uh, everyone has the right camera. And for instance, I have a Fujifilm camera. I can't even tell you which one. So (laughs) I don't even know if it's... We we uh, won't hold that against you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't even know if that is the right camera, if I have the right gear to step mm-hmm. into that community without being judged. Because usually people who are so passionate about this hobby also know a lot about the tech. 
that comes with mm-hmm. the hobby, which can feel almost like the gateway into the community. I'm not saying it is that way, definitely not. But I'm saying as someone who can be a people pleaser, I would feel, um, you know, there's there's a lot of pressure for me to almost check a lot of boxes or to already have some type mm. of expertise before I can mm. even engage with these people I see as experts. No, that's that's a very good point. Generally, generally, landscape photographers and, and nature photographers are, are generally nice people. And I, I would be surprised <laughs> if you if, if just a normal person messaged them that they, they didn't reply in, in some polite way. Um, but definitely there's, there's, a, there's a huge fear that people don't know how to use. And that's where a lot of my private clients come from. You know, they'll, mm. they'll book a private session with me so that I can teach them, you know, how to use their gear and yeah. how to edit their photos so that they, they feel comfortable with what they're doing. Um, there's a lot you can learn online in that, but it's, it's not the same as, as being with other people. You know, it's, it's, you can learn a lot, but it's, it's not the same as that experience that, that you learn. And I think then we, you know, get a lot of people who then will come on workshops and that. In in terms of our workshops, we don't generally get any novices. So I would say by that, I mean people who book workshops with us are competent in terms of they can shoot in manual mode on their camera. They're not just yeah. shooting in auto. They have a DSLR, so they don't just have a compact camera or their cell phone. So the people who are booking on, on trips with us are generally people who are, I would say, more a bit competent with their gear and, and their skill level. So it's for us, it's like, how do we now get into those new guys that want to like explore mm. this as a hobby? You know, they've been taking pictures with their phones on social media. Yeah. They've, they're getting a love for it. They, they're realizing there's a limitation with what they can achieve with their phone. Mm. And now they've they want to buy a camera. Um, <clears throat> So that's where, like, I think you find landscape photographers will do things like on their YouTube channel where they'll put it like, what's in my camera bag? You know, what gear do I yeah. recommend? Um, mm. Photo companies like like Orms that sell gear will have a large amount of like blog posts and interviews with landscape photographers, um, local guys, mm-hmm. you know, what are they shooting with? What techniques are they using? So I think there are a lot of resources that people can tap into without having to necessarily do that that face-on-face thing bef- before they get to that point, mm. um, just to learn a, a little bit about the the mechanics and the workings of, of the, the gear and the equipment. But yeah, I mean, I think that's what you're saying is true in, in any field or any hobby or any industry. There's got to be mm-hmm. that where you take that step and, and just put yourself out there and, you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Some, some guys are, are, are cruel and they'll be like, oh, I can't believe you posted that. It looks terrible. And they, they hopefully won't mm-hmm. say it to your face. And, and I think you just got to take <laughs> that and, and, and just be like, you know, is the photo I took this year better than the photo I took last year? And if you're seeing that improvement and that growth, then you know you're heading in the right direction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, I hate um, the first photos I took. They're terrible. I just delete them. <laughs> <laughs> so bad. <laughs> yeah, when I think about some of the first things I designed, I feel yeah. the exact same way. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think I think the main thing is just not to be, like, arrogant or cocky when you think you know stuff when mm-hmm. you're dealing with other people. I think if you just come in mm-hmm. very humble and be like, look, I tried, um, I think the community mm-hmm. is going to accept you pretty quickly. Yeah. So um, I, I sort of want to roll back the conversation a little bit because I sort of thought of something um, and hopefully you can share this. So you, you, so you, you mentioned like as a landscape photographer, you almost have this like secret stash of locations that you, <laughs> you, 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 you go to and you sort of take your picture and then you kind of go undercover again and make sure no one sees your trail, you know. <laughs> um, and you, you sort of mentioned that you've got three or four shots that you're kind of like you haven't managed to get the cycle absolutely right. Are there some examples of ones that you actually have managed to capture that you could maybe talk us through a little bit? Tell us a little bit of the the planning, the thinking, and how it kind of turned out. Okay, I'll tell you about one that I still want to get that I'm halfway through first, just just to give you an idea. So, uh, 
So a photo that, that I've always wanted to capture, that's, that's, I've been wanting to capture for a good number of years now. I just think like pre-COVID is, is a good number of years back is um, I wanted to capture a photo of the low fog from Lion's Head side looking back onto Table Mountain. So you have the low fog, Table Mountain above it, and then the sky above. So almost like Table Mountain's floating Yo. in the fog. <clears throat> So that that's so that's crazy. a photo I want to achieve, and I've attempted it maybe about eight nine times, Jeez. and the best I've got oh, is wow. halfway. So I've got Table Mountain, the fog only came in halfway, um, mm. yeah. and then ideally I want to do it when it's still dark, so that the city lights are lighting up under the fog, um, <laughs> wow. and um, so <laughs> you so get this specific. like glow. <laughs> it's it's very specific. Mm. Um, <laughs> So actually, if you go to my Instagram, you'll probably see it. It's just got a star trail with Table Mountain, and then the fog's about halfway in. And I want one where the fog mm. is completely across. Um, and that's that. So that's a photo. I'm, I'm just waiting. When the weather conditions are right, I try and do it. Um, let me see yeah. if I can find it for you quickly while we're talking. But yeah, that, that's one that, that's on my bucket list that I want to achieve. Um, let me see. Yeah. Um, I guess, yeah. I mean, while, while you sort of look for that, I, I have to ad- admit, like, th- it's almost like there's an aspect to what you describe as kind of like hunting. Like, you mm. know, when I think about hunting, <laughs> like, outside of the actual, and then I, I guess it's kind of funny that we had that whole thing about the, sh- the shooting. And yeah. The shots. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, like, there's this there's this aspect of, like, tracking and planning and sort of, like, I guess your 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 subject is maybe a bit more nature that well, the landscape than than an animal. But like, you almost need to put yourself in that environment, and then kind of like just observe. And I don't know. I think like, it's an aspect of people. I guess. So I don't know Oof. if you guys can see, but it's basically that, but with low fog across the bottom. I can't find the one where I've got yeah, it halfway I now. I saw that photo, yeah. With, with it about halfway. Um, yeah, so that's uh, something I want to achieve. There's a few others, you know, the bioluminescence that we get you at Kokhul Bay. That is amazing to go and see. And now, Stephanie, that you live in mm. Somerset West, uh, summer, go take a drive on Clarence Drive in the evening. It's absolutely amazing to see the sea whenever the waves hit is blue, like on Avatar, exactly like sure. Avatar. Wow. Um, okay. What? Yeah, bioluminescence. It's it's the sea like lights up blue and it's agitated from the algae. Jeez. Super, super cool to Town. see. Yeah, in Cape Town, when it's hot summer days, Crazy. no wind, the algae mm. blooms. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's super wow. cool and it's, I think, quite a unique event that, that we get. Yeah, so that's pretty cool to go and shoot. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And then I want, um, Alfie also did ask, because I really want to hear a story about, you know, a shot that you were chasing for a long time that you captured. Sorry, so that's the one where the fog's halfway. So I want to get one where Mm -hmm. it goes all the way across. Yeah. And then, sorry, I'm I'm going completely off. But that's the bioluminescence. (laughs) Um, in the water, the way. Jeez, like that's insane. Yeah, it it's insane. So oh my word. It, it's that bright. It's super bright. Yes. That's crazy. Wow. Anyway, so if you're if you're on if you're on Spotify or Apple Music, hop over to YouTube. We'll try and get a picture. Of <laughs> this, you, um, like a, a high high res one. That was mind blowing. It's kind of like the Northern Lights, but in the sea. Wow. Yeah, so the, the bioluminescence is super cool to, to shoot and, and see. It's amazing. Um, mm. So one of the That's workshops really cool. we do, yeah. we, we run in that area, in that location. And um, on one of the nights, whenever we run a workshop there, we'll take a drive out and see if it's there. And it's, it's probably mm. there maybe one out of every five workshops. But, you know, those people get a, a spectacular show when, when we yeah. are able to see it. Yeah, wow. I can imagine. All right. Um, I think, um, where were we? We were, yes, we were asking about... You were asking about, me a really uh, cool question that yes. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it was about um, a shot that you have been chasing for a long time, but you actually did get it. And which one that is and the story behind it. 
Sure. I mean, there's quite a few. Um, so I, I have a, a passion for astrophotography. So I love shooting yes. night mm-hmm. sky and, and astrophotography. So I, you know, I set projects for myself. It gives me something to work towards and, and to do. So uh, one of the projects that I've done is I've shot, I'm missing one arch. So I'm doing, there's six, there's five, well, it depends who you speak to. There's, there's five well-known arches in the Cedarburg. And mm-hmm. I've shot um, Astro um, over all but one, which I'm doing um, in October this year. I'll get my last shot. That's so then so I've got, cool. so that's a cool project where over time and you hike and you go to the different places, you build up a collection and you get, you know, that cool collection of all the arches that I've shot the Milky Way with. Um, mm. Another cool one was two, Three years ago, I did the Geminids meteor shower. It happened to coincide with a new moon, so there was no moon in the sky. Um, And I went and shot that out in the Cedarburg by one of the arches, and I was able to capture the meteor shower um, throughout the night, which was super cool to go and watch and see. Um, Yeah, and then for the last two years, I've been super lucky to go to Namibia, five times and shoot the water in the wow. desert, uh, which is quite rare because it's it only rains like it has like every six to eight years. Um, so to be able to go and shoot sure. the, the water in the desert and see the green grasses grow on sand dunes is, has been absolutely insane. Yep. And that's been a, a special highlight for me. And it's, it's one of the kind of the talks I'm doing at the moment at all the camera clubs and that is about my Namibia trips and, and all that content that I got there. Um, so wow. I don't know if you can see on my socials, probably posted it quite recently where you have these super green fields in the desert. Um, I so am just have, so far down. Yeah, so you have green, green, green fields. <laughs> Amazing sand dunes with like rain and behind the sand dunes. It's, it's simply been incredible to be in Namibia. And uh, it was one pro of, of COVID, you know, normally you go there and there mm. are tourists everywhere and their mm. footprints on all the dunes. And it's really difficult as Yo. a landscape photographer to, to capture these areas because oh, wow. there's so, so much evidence of, of, of humans being there, especially uh, the well-known dunes will just have footprints all over them. So during mm-hmm. COVID, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the, the basically I went in 2018 pre-COVID. Um, I was in dead flay with maybe 500 other people. Yo, mm-hmm. um, it's a lot of people. Last year I was standing there in the afternoon all by myself, not another person. It Magical, wow. magical experience wow. to be in a place like That's that. That's crazy. With, with not a single other person yeah. around you. Very, very, very special. And wow. Um, to have the weather that we had with no tourists around was was very unique for the last two years. And unfortunately, from end of this year, next year, the, the tourists will be coming back and, and those conditions are gone, um, which is, is, is sad, but also really good for the, the local economy that runs on tourism. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a pro and a con, but it, it'll be difficult for me to go back to those areas and, and shoot it in the mm-hmm. same way that I have before. Sure. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Um, I think we're probably probably sort of stepping into the closing stages of this discussion. But maybe one one last thing before we do do that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what's what's sort of next? Um, you know, what do you have planned in the calendar? Either that you're looking forward to, or maybe that you might want to let the people <laughs> listening hear hear about. Well, I have the, I have the things on my bucket list that I can't afford to do yet, but that are on there. Like I want to go to. <laughs> Madagascar and Antarctica, and, mm-hmm. uh, but maybe one day I'll, I'll wow. get there. Um, but um, um, trips that I have planned, I'm going to Namibia at the end of June uh, for five days, uh, specifically mm-hmm. to shoot astrophotography. So uh, we're going camping. I'm staying in the quiver tree forest, which is going to be great. It's going to get a lot of content in the quiver trees. And then I'm going to some remote locations that I haven't been before um, scouting for some new locations. So um, I try and do at least one big um, recce trip a year and then potentially like one or two smaller ones like this where I go and look for new places to potentially run new workshops to with clients um, or to get content for myself for my portfolio. Yeah, That's amazing. Nice. Um, 
we'll definitely keep an eye out for those for those photos when when you eventually do make those trips um and maybe for anyone else who wants to follow some of your work where can where can people follow or kind of get in contact um, so I have just updated my website, which is great at the beginning of the year. So they can go to my website, www.kylegage.com. Um, if you struggle to spell that, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram at Kyle in CPT, Kyle in Cape Town. Um, and then from there, the links, you can go to my website. But for my most recent work, um, you will find it on my mm. social media and my Instagram. Um, and then for behind the scenes videos and, and some fun stuff, you can check me out on TikTok. I'm still on there. I'm still young. Getting hey. young. Okay. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's good to put out, uh, you know, I share a lot of video on my phone and, and things like yeah. that behind the mm. scenes when you're on trips and that. So it's been great just putting all that content together. And I think people get a better snapshot about what happens on a trip and, and the behind the scenes and capturing some pictures. Mm. I did have a, a quick question because um, I've seen some of your behind the scenes footage and stuff. And I think you also brilliant at the way you edit photos. Do any of your workshops include some editing tips or um, training or something like that? Yeah, so that's that's a very good question. So our workshops are, are quite tailored. So for the one we just got back from two weeks ago, um, we did a workshop in the Karoo on astrophotography where we shot mm-hmm. um, old broken windmills, an old car, um, and then the aloes, um, the mountain aloes. Um, so very Karoo-based astrophotography. Mm. And then that yeah. one was more of a masterclass. So there was a large element of actual teaching techniques such as you know how to make star trails, how to make time lapses, how to edit those photos. Because especially when you're getting to like the astrophotography, there's Mm. a much larger element of post-processing and more technical skills you need to know Mm. how to do in order to get an an image out. Um, So for like those type of workshops, Mm -hmm. there's definitely a large part of of post-processing work that we offer you that is included on the workshop. And then this weekend coming, um, we're running a editing retreat out in series um, on a farm. And it's it's purely editing. So we will be spending the weekend uh, teaching guys full editing workflow, teaching them theory behind wow. things, you know, how to understand color, how to understand contrast, how to shoot with editing in mind so that you, you capture the right things you need to capture, knowing how you're going to put it together mm-hmm. and edit it at the end. So, yeah, that's quite exciting. It's, it's our first workshop that is solely focused on editing. Um, that we're doing this weekend. Wow. We're hoping to run that about twice a year. We'll run it kind of in our, our nice. off seasons and then focus on the editing. Mm-hmm. That's well, amazing. good luck for that. Thank you. Definitely. Um, yeah, you hear that, guys? So if you are interested in sharpening your photo editing skills, definitely, definitely reach out and attend one of those. Um but yeah, Kyle, I just want to say thank you so much for, for, for making the time to chat with us. It's been it's been really great sort of hearing your story and sort of walking along um with like hearing about your journey. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's always great um uh, to chat about where I've come and it also makes me think about, you know, actually you don't think about something, you just hit the ground running and then actually looking back and <laughs> chatting about it, it's it's just nice to see where you've come from and where you've ended up. Definitely. Yeah, Amazing. and just to repeat what Alfie said, it's it's been so nice, you know. Um, if when especially for him and I, we're not in the community at all, and we're just looking from the outside in, and it's 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 so enlightening almost to to hear what you go through uh, to capture these mm-hmm. shots and what some of the stories are and the experience to to do that, and definitely have a deeper appreciation now for um, some of the photos you have captured. <laughs> well, you need to yeah. dust off that Fuji and, and come out and take some photos. <laughs> you live in Cape Town now. There's no excuse not to. <laughs> exactly. <Steph>. Definitely. <laughs> cool. All right, then. Um, I think we will call it there. For everybody listening, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. 